Surveying his feet with glowing pride, Sibio felt a ripple run down the muscles of his arms. He dropped the heavy axe and wiped the perspiration from his brows, from his bare brown arms. But how hard and powerful they became when he tensed them. As hard as seasoned, nodded Yantak. Triumphantly he raised his arms above his head and, facing the afternoon sun, he thrust out his chest and made every muscle of his body tense. His chest was flat, his neck long, and his legs thin. He was one of those boys who, the village people said grew too fast. Sabio went to Tia Binai's house after helping his mother. When he reached Tia Binai's place, he saw the evening's work had already begun. All about the moonlit clearing that stood at a distance from the house were grouped young men and women whose gay laughter and voices carried far into the distance. Who is this? She asked kindly. It's Sibio, Tia Binai. Sibio? She could not place the name. Sibiong Pasmado roared someone from a group close to him. I, yes. Now I know. Nane told me to give this to you and to thank you for those herbs. The old woman gave a grunt of satisfaction. Of course they would do her good. Why, my grandmother used them before I did, and so did her great-granduncle before her. After a while, so lost was he in his thoughts that he did not see a package done up in banana leaf which a small white hand held out to him not until a voice spoke. Here, Sebio, never mind those people. They are idlers. Try this suman. I made it myself. Merci, you must have flavored this with your kisses, he boldly ventured. The gratified girl blushed to the roots of her hair. Tia Binai assigned Sibio, Merci and Pacio the bully to pound the rice grains together using pestles. Pacio showed off how strong he was and taunted Sibio. He felt competitive to also make Merci and the other villagers admire him but how, he doesn't know. Pacio, with the attention of the crowd, asked Tia Binai what her son-in-law would be like. Mercy cried that he needed to be her husband first which silenced the teasers for a while. Milio, the village clown, made a show of bending a pretend horseshoe made of bamboo. While everyone laughed. At this, Paseo strained himself to straighten out a real horseshoe. This made the audience amazed by what had taken place. Having caught the piece of iron, Sabio tried to bend it to no effect. Yet he knew for sure that he could done it. Embarrassed, he retreated to a corner. Merci, having felt Sabio's depression approach him and ask him to help her gather haze to make a fire. Sabio eagerly followed her to the hay pile. While Sabio and Merci gathered haze, Merci suddenly shrieked. Sabio went to see. What caused it and saw the deadly Dahong Pele ready to attack at Mercy who was like frozen to the ground. Instinctively, Sabio managed to place himself between the girl and the danger. He fell on his face and was gone. Before he could get up, the snake had bitten him on the calf of the leg and was gone. Sabio couldn't think well, his thoughts whirled crazily. While the few stood there, barking orders, desperate to help Sibio. Others were paralyzed into inaction. It was Mercy who tied a ligature above the wound on the leg of Sibio, trying to keep the poison from spreading. Unexpectedly, Sibio ordered a knife. Several sped to get a knife and someone was able to give him large knife. 
With the crowd witnessing, Sabio sees the horseshoe and, before the faces that have frequently taunted him, he straightened it as if it were a hairpin. Then he wrapped a piece of cloth around one and shoved the other end into the fire. The onlookers could only stare and stare now at the colorless face of Sebio, grim and twisted. Then, Sebio took the sharp knife and slashed across the two pinpricks. Dark blood oozed out slowly. He then grasped the red hot iron and plunged it into the wound. The smell of the burning flesh filled the air. The women shrieked and those who could no longer stand the sight fainted. With him held up he told crowd calmly that never again would he be called Sebiang Pasmato.